Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the May edition of the Bizval webinar. Today, we're going to be talking, or rather, the, the finance ghost is going to be talking about platform profits and how platform businesses and startups, you know, go from, you know, I guess, deep J curves into starting to print cash and becoming extremely val valuable businesses in some instances. Before we get going, just some uh, basic housekeeping. Please remember that the chat section is set to private, but please feel free to add any comments or questions as we go along. Uh, the moderators can see those. We also have a poll running today, so if you can click on the poll, and it's a very simple one. What are you more focused on, growing revenue or profit margins? So you don't have to answer that just yet, but as we go through, you can, you can go and answer that. And then a reminder around the handout. Um, so in our handout section, we've got the latest Bizval newsletter from the 13th of May. And there will be a new newsletter if you subscribe that will be going out later today or early tomorrow morning. Just a comment on our newsletters. Our newsletters are really jam-packed with you know, all the insights from the last month, interviews, webinars, and general tips and advice to business owners as to how they can go about improving the value of their business. So if you're not subscribed to our newsletter, please check it out, subscribe. If you enjoy it, please share it with your friends. And you know, it's a great resource, we think, at least, um, you know, to empower you and inform you as a business owner. So I need to just get my uh, screen sharing working here. Without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to the finance ghost. Well, actually, there is one thing. Uh, insight from our previous webinar, we did ask a question around startups and whether you were founder, funder, both or neither. Um, and interestingly, almost half the attendees or the responders were, were founders, uh, quite a few both. So that was from our last webinar, and that is available on our YouTube channel if you want to go and check that out. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over the ghost who's going to take us through today's session. Ghost, over to you. Yeah, thanks so much, Graham, and thank you to all of the attendees. I think it's going to be an interesting one today, maybe a bit shorter than normal, but we'll see how many questions there are. So I think if we get on to the next slide and you're going to get hit with a chart pretty much straight away, shock and horror. So don't spend too much time reading it because I want to explain it properly. So the point of today's webinar is actually just to talk to these kind of platform economics. Now, obviously, uh, you know, we see this a lot on the US market, the kind of big tech companies that are out there. They seem to lose a lot of money and then out of nowhere, they suddenly make even more money. And of course, this is what makes them quite interesting to value. And it's part of why our approach to valuing startups is what it is. So the first question here is Google Cloud. That's the thing I've used as an example here. Now, this is not the whole of Google. This is specifically Google Cloud. And the question is, is Google Cloud a startup? Now, it very much depends on how you define a startup. And it sounds ridiculous to think that something within Google could be considered a startup. But it actually has a lot of the attributes of something that, in my mind at least, is, is very startup-y. Because if we define a startup as a business that looks to solve a problem while walking an uncertain road, then absolutely it's a startup. There are lots of listed companies that are really startups in nature. And as we regularly see in this world of big tech, uh, Google Cloud was actually incubated by a cash cow. Now, in this case, the cash cow was Google's search business. And you can see why it needed to be incubated. Because if you have a look at that chart, which is dealing with quarterly revenue and operating income, just look at those losses. They only started separately disclose, uh, disclosing Google Cloud in Q1 of 2020. Before that, it was kind of just bundled in. And it made losses for another couple of years thereafter. It only turned positive in Q1 of 2023. So that is why you generally need some kind of cash cow to incubate one of these platforms. Now, this is despite the revenue progression looking quite linear. So that's the blue bars there, obviously. And you can kind of see how revenue has just ticked up beautifully. You know, it's like three and a half times higher than it was a couple of years ago. And operating losses, despite that tick up in revenue, you can see how they were kind of in a range for a year and then in another range for a year and then in another range for a year. You can almost see how the management team was basically saying, it's okay if we're making losses for now. The market supports this. 
So let's just keep reinvesting in the business. Let's make sure we are building out what we need to build out in order to support the revenue going forward. We now finally see that it has turned positive, but again, it's kind of positive, you know, within a fairly tight range. If you have a look over the past year, they've added roughly $2 billion in revenue, but it's only added about $700 million in operating income. So, you know, it doesn't, it still doesn't completely drop to the bottom line. Even a platform is still going to have expenses, even as it gets bigger. But I think what's important about this chart is to just see how that progression actually works and how long these things make losses for before they suddenly turn positive. So I think, Graham, we can go to the next one. Now, the point here is how do you value this? So the circle shows the period of time over which operating income was negative. So you can't go and do an earnings multiple valuation here because you don't have earnings to go and apply the multiple to. You can't take a price earnings multiple and go and apply it to losses. That doesn't work. Can you go and do it now that the thing is positive? Well, the temptation is to say yes, obviously, because you now actually have some earnings to go and apply this to. But will it give you the right answer or is it going to give you something that maybe looks too low? Now, the problem here is that although the business is making profits, it is still a very long way off operating at the sort of margins we would expect to see when this thing is operating at scale. So just an example that I've given there is if you go and look at their Q124 numbers, you've got an operating income margin of around 9.4%. And this compares extremely poorly to Amazon Web Services, which is obviously one of the absolute leaders in this space. They are running at a margin of more like 37.5%. Now, Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud are not identical businesses, but it shows you how subscale Google Cloud is right now relative to an industry leader. What that means is that if you take an earnings multiple and you try and apply it to these earnings, you are in all likelihood going to undervalue Google because you're not really taking into account the growth potential here. So just because a startup is finally profitable still doesn't mean that it's ready for you to just take a general earnings multiple from somewhere in the market and go and apply it to those numbers. Now, if we go to the next slide, this is the way that people try and address this issue as often as they can, which is to say, okay, cool. We know that we're light on earnings, that's fine, but we've got revenue multiples, so we'll just use that. Now, as tempting as this is, it doesn't consider two critical metrics. The first one is the structural margins in the business. No two businesses are alike. So how do you take a revenue multiple from one and apply it to the other? That's like going and buying a car and only looking at the bonnet and you don't care about everything that happens behind that. It just doesn't make sense. The second thing that it does not take into account is how quickly the business is growing. Again, even if two businesses are identical in terms of their margins, surely you would want to pay more for the business that is faster growing. This is why platforms tend to trade at different revenue multiples, but it's also why there are always opportunities in the listed market when things are at similar revenue multiples and it doesn't always make sense why. And I'm going to talk about the effect of sentiment now. So this is a really important thing to understand is that if you go and look at these listed traded companies and you try and say, okay, great, you know, I looked at Netflix and hence this platform that I'm trying to value as a private company should be on a similar valuation multiple because you know, there's a great example that I can go and point to. Now, you can't just take one point estimates and say, hey, that's the correct valuation, because you need to be conscious of what the sentiment has been that has taken us there. And that's what I've tried to show there in that table. So you can see at Airbnb, they are operating at the moment at a higher free cash flow margin, 30.5%, plays 19.9 at Netflix. They are also running at a higher Revenue growth rate in the latest quarter, 18%, plays 14.8% at Netflix. And despite this, the revenue multiple at Airbnb sits at 8.1, whereas at Netflix, it sits at 7.9. Now, this looks kind of strange, right? Because you would look at that and say, Airbnb is a higher margin business. It's growing faster. Surely it should be at a much higher revenue multiple than Netflix. So now the next piece of this analysis is to say, okay, what is their average multiple over five years? This tells you something about whether the business is, is, is valued higher by the market now than its historical averages or lower. And you can see at Airbnb, the five-year average revenue multiple, 13.3x, it's currently at 8.1x. So it is way down 
on its historical averages. So technically speaking, this tells you either Airbnb is a little bit cheap right now, or it's kind of fallen out of favor with the market and should never ever have been with those sort of multiples. It's had to unwind that multiple over time. Netflix, on the other hand, is actually at a revenue multiple above its five-year average, which tells you that the market right now is loving the Netflix story for whatever reason, and you need to go and dig in and understand what those reasons might be. So the 12-month share price return then confirms what has been the recent move in sentiment and momentum. Netflix, 12-month share price return up 75%, Airbnb up 36%. Now, you certainly wouldn't be upset if you hold shares in Airbnb. Up 36% in dollars is just fine, thank you very much. But you would have rather held shares in Netflix. And this shows you that sentiment right now in streaming is absolutely fantastic. You've got the leader in streaming trading above its five-year average multiple, even though it's not growing as fast as some other platforms and doesn't make as much margin. And the share price performance has been fantastic. So if you look at a streaming business right now and you just take Netflix as a point estimate and say, hey, here's where it's at. Yes, you are bringing in some sentiment and maybe that's a good thing if you're going to market right now. But it's also a bad thing in that you're not really looking at where this business has come from. What are the specifics of Netflix versus what you are looking at? And maybe the business you are looking at is actually a little bit more like Airbnb. And what does that mean at the moment in terms of sentiment or in terms of the right multiples? So the point here is that revenue multiples in isolation are very dangerous. You need to understand what is behind that multiple across margins, growth rates, historical averages, and where the share price return has really come from. So if we go to the last slide, this is where we talk to how we actually value platforms. Now, in our approach to all startups, but you know, platforms are just one type really, we consider all of the challenges that have been raised here by actually building a proper bottom-up financial model. And we do it based on the best available forecasts from the business, but also just sensible benchmarks where we actually go and understand why the numbers are the numbers. And there are several advantages in doing this versus just taking a simple valuation multiple. So the first one is that you can actually forecast your revenue properly per product and service. And this allows for far more realistic and blue sky scenarios to actually be laid out in the model. The second point is unit economics, and these can be properly considered, revealing whether that business model is lucrative or is of concern. In other words, we actually really dig down into how does this business make money? Every time it sells a product or a service, where is that money coming from? Is this thing lucrative or not? The third benefit is that the road to scale becomes visible. Now, if you think back to that Google Cloud chart and why it's so important not to just take one quarter's numbers and value the thing, it's because you need to be able to look ahead and say, okay, how long is it going to take us to get to break even? What does it look like after that? How long do we take to get to actually being a scale player? And you know, what are the sort of losses along the way to actually achieve that? Now, the fourth point is kind of linked to that, which is you know, how long is it going to take to actually get to profitable cash flows? So it's not just how much will we likely lose, it's how long is it going to take? And also, what are the scale level margins? So you've got to think about that chart, that Google Cloud chart really does tell the whole story of why it's so important to go and do proper forecasting. And of course, the fifth point here is we can then use different required rates of return or cash discount rates based on how risky that underlying forecast actually is. So this is our proprietary valuation approach that we use for startups. And we think it's the best of both worlds. It has an appreciation in it for the journey to profitability and the size of the prize, but it also builds in an understanding of how sophisticated investors will view risk and cash flow. And I think what's been quite interesting for me in the past couple of years, particularly in the public market space, is to see how many of the more traditional financial investors have now started paying real attention to the likes of Netflix, et cetera, because they can see that these platforms don't just lose money forever. They lose money for a period of time, they swing into profitability, and then they make a fortune. So the idea of this discussion today was really just to give one great example of why it is so important to be careful of point estimates and to build out proper financial forecasts. Thanks for the, the background. And I'm sure there's there's a lot of questions around this, you know. And I think going back to the to the theme is like, you know, how platform profits or how do startups start printing cash? So I think you've given some examples around kind of how it works in practice. And I'm just gonna 
uh, turn these slides off for a second if I can figure out how to how to do that. Um, but you know, can you talk a little bit about you know what some of the key assumptions are here? You know, they go through what I guess we call a very long J curve. Um, and then there comes a point, I guess, where you get a critical mass where everything above that is pure profit. Um, you know, as opposed to, let's call it a mom and pop type store, where from day one, you need to be making profits. These have got a long J curve. And then you know, beyond that point, everything is additive. But I guess there's also a downside to that. If kind of people stop using the platform, you can also very quickly go the other way around. So maybe you can just share a little bit about you know, that kind of massive potential upside, but also, you know, if you don't get the scale, what are the implications of that? Yeah, absolutely. So the reason that venture capitalists plow money into these things is because the unit economics are fantastic. So basically that means, you know, every time I go onto Airbnb and I book something, Airbnb is making a lot of money from that incremental booking. And if you think about it, it's because all of the fixed costs already happen. Just think about calling an Uber. Uber is going to take a cut on that trip. But what is Uber's real fixed cost or variable cost rather on me taking that trip? Yes, they need to accept a payment. And that obviously comes with a bit of a cost. But beyond that, this thing goes into a great big machine that has been built and tested a billion times over. And along comes a driver and off I go and Uber makes a clip on that. So the point here is that incremental profits look excellent, but it takes a lot of infrastructure to get to that point. And that is why they lose money for a long time is because they are investing heavily, heavily, heavily in infrastructure. Now, what's also quite interesting, and there's been a lot of uh, technical papers written on this is, you know, do modern accounting rules actually allow for this? So if you think about it, old school accounting approach, if you go and build a factory, you know, an old style manufacturing business, you're going to go and uh, pump CapEx into it and you're going to depreciate that factory over time. But you're not going to go and expense the whole cost of that factory in year one because it's going to produce for you over years. In these tech businesses, to a large extent, they are forced to recognize their costs in the year they happen, particularly when, when it comes to things like developers and everyone else. So they are draining cash, absolutely. And it looks like they are losing a lot of money, but they are also building a platform of value. Now, provided they get it right in terms of this is something that actually has a place in the market and will attract users and does really well, you know, they can make a huge amount of money. So the risk you quite correctly raise is what happens if they just don't get the uptake, you know, and this does happen. Or sometimes they get the uptake and then they think it will stay around forever. But then what happens is there's a change in consumer behavior and it doesn't stick. And now they've gone and ramped up all their costs and suddenly the revenue, the revenue just washes away. So Peloton is a really good example in the US market of exactly that playing out. Obviously, in those cases, it's very, very painful for investors because you have a scenario where the infrastructure built was actually just too big. Uh, the unit economics might still look good, but there aren't enough users. And that only ever ends in layoffs and all kinds of other problems, potential down rounds if it's a VC play. You know, that, that's where the issue is coming very quickly. Thanks, Ghost. Um... I think there's a question that's come through from Raymond, and, and I think you might have touched on it at the beginning, but um, I think it's a great question. But but what is actually the definition of a platform? So we speak about this, but you know, can you maybe just break that down? Is is how what is a platform business, and you know, how's it different to I guess a non-platform business? Yeah, so platforms will mean different things to different people, and there might be textbook examples here and there, but it's always nicer when you actually just have a really cool real-world example. So I'll use the example of Uber. So basically they built Uber out and it's got a payments element, it's got maps, it's got security, it's got user data, it's got all kinds of wonderful things. And it benefits from having more users on either side of the platform. So it's basically a two-sided platform where the more people using it and requesting trips, the better, because that leads to more people providing the trips on the other side because they believe they will get more trips. So it becomes this beautiful circle because once again, the more people providing the rides, the more likely it is that someone asking for a ride will get one very quickly. So a platform, when it's working, you know, it grows very, very quickly. There's this beautiful flywheel effect. Of course, when it stops working, then it dies very quickly because the only reason Uber has value is because you believe when you order a car, you will actually get a car. So that's an important point to, to keep in mind. But there's another element of platforms that I think is worth raising, which is how adaptable they often are. So we've seen this at Airbnb, you know, something that started out as just 
find him somewhere to sleep, it was very easy for them to add on the experiences side of the business. If you're traveling somewhere, why not book yourself some kind of cool local experience as well? What does the platform do? It connects people to experiences, whether it's a bed or a hot air balloon ride, and it takes their money, right? It's a payments thing. It's a security thing. It allows you to get refunds. It allows you to see reviews of things. What else can this easily apply to? It can apply to experiences. With Uber, if I'm ordering a car and I need to be able to put in my information in about where I am and it takes a payment and I can track it, well, why not order my food as well? Why not send a package somewhere like I can with Uber as well? So that's really the definition for me at least of a platform. It's got that kind of flywheel inside it somewhere where the more the users over time, just the more valuable it becomes. And it's also this very nice adaptable piece of technology where you can actually layer on additional services and that kind of thing to really start to juice up those scale level margins. And the best platforms in the world are the ones that really are just the most adaptable. I guess by that definition, even businesses like Apple, for instance, I mean, they're not mobile phone businesses, they're actually platform businesses. Yeah, I mean, the services side of Apple has got incredible unit economics, it, it really does. So what's interesting with Apple is what's happening is, is hardware sales are slowing down. But because there are more and more installed devices out there, the services business just keeps growing. And so you're having this weird situation at Apple, where gross margin just keeps going up every single year, because of revenue mix. They're basically just making more and more from services every year as a percentage of total revenue, which comes in at a, at a vast gross margin compared to the devices. And so the average mm -hmm. blended gross margin in the group just keeps ticking up over time. And that's part of why people put so much value on a group like Apple. 100%. Ghost, there's a question here from John. It says, does this approach differ for platforms across the world? Um, and if so, how? So the basics don't in terms of needing to go and actually, you know, put out a whole forecast and understand the things, scalability and profitability, etc. The fundamental principles are, are much the same. Obviously, what differs is the actual economics. So if you are scaling a platform into a very large market that loves this kind of thing, that is easier, arguably, than scaling into a, a smaller market. Of course, it's not always that easy because there's more competition, et cetera, et cetera. So then again, it all comes down to the specifics of this thing. Um, and there's also the element of, you know, that there's an article that we released on BizVolage in the last couple of weeks about why Silicon Valley businesses are more valuable than startups elsewhere in the world. And it comes down to that ecosystem in which they operate, the likelihood of finding other people who can partner with you on making that platform more valuable or other products or you know, devs with great ideas, et cetera. It's very much that kind of world where there's lots of brainstorming, there's lots of pivoting, a, a word that startups obviously really love. Uh, and that does, that does get taken into account. That's why you do typically see very high valuations in the US for platform style businesses. And you'll see those sort of businesses elsewhere in the world for sure. I mean, we've seen a number of them um, in Bizval in the private space. And you also have to be very careful taking those US valuations and applying them elsewhere. It's, uh, it's very rarely correct. Fantastic. There's a couple more questions and um, maybe just deal with the first one is you, know, you talk about free cash flow being an important metric. Um, so, so why is it such an important metric and are there ways that companies kind of try and skew this metric? Yeah, so free cash flow is a very important metric and the traditional value, uh, the traditional definition of free cash flow basically is your cash profits less the capex that you need to reinvest in the business and less the working capital that also needs to stay behind in the business in order for you to operate. So the point of free cash flow is we're basically saying after running and growing the business, what is left? You know, what is actually being like spat out of this big machine? Uh, is there any cash coming out of it or is there not? So at the end of the day, no matter what you might read elsewhere or what VCs might try and convince themselves of, a business does not have long-term value if it is not generating free cash flow. That's just how it is. And I think that situation is made uh, even worse slash more obvious when you're in a higher interest rate environment like we're in now, where money actually costs something and people are not happy to just sit around and wait forever to actually get a return. This means that companies are obviously very incentivized to try and show you a great free cash flow answer, even when there isn't one. 
And the classic trick among listed companies in the US is share-based payments. So what they do is they pay their staff a big chunk of their remuneration in shares rather than in cash. And so what do they do? They say, oh, look at how much free cash flow is coming out of this business. Never mind the fact that $10 million just went into share-based payments to our staff and diluted all our existing shareholders. You know, don't worry about that. A whole lot of free cash flow came out the other side. And shock and horror, we're going to use that free cash flow to buy back the shares that we issued to our staff. So you've got to be very, very careful when you see stuff like that, especially if you follow public companies. Private companies, you won't often see stuff like that. But it's good to understand that startups in general, all companies actually, are quite incentivized to show the best free cash flow numbers they possibly can. Fantastic. I think maybe, you know, let's take this as the last question. Um, so you spoke about free cash flow, but what are some of the other metrics that are really important in platform businesses. So maybe some of the other leading metrics and things that you know you need to look at. Yeah, so you'll often see the concept of ARPU come up, which is uh, average revenue per user. So that's ARPU. And the other one is the cost of acquiring a customer or CAC. Those two things are, are quite important and they are basically just measures of the unit economics. So I'll use Netflix as an example again. Uh, selling a Netflix subscription in the US is much more lucrative for Netflix than selling a subscription in an emerging market because the emerging market simply cannot absorb the cost of a Netflix subscription at that price. So they're getting more dollars per user in the US than they are actually getting elsewhere in the world. And over time, if all the growth is coming from emerging markets, this impacts average revenue per user. The group ARPU goes the wrong way because the mix is changing. You have more and more people sitting with Netflix in an emerging market than in the US. Now, the cost of acquiring a customer is the other side of that, which is to say, how much am I spending to actually bring this customer onto the books? So the average revenue per user, less that cost of acquiring a customer is giving you a very good idea of what is the benefit? What is the genuine contribution of bringing in another customer or paying subscriber or client or whatever it is you do into your business? And if that contribution margin is very nice and juicy, then you have something that is worth scaling as quickly as you can. If the contribution margins are broken, then if you scale that thing, all you are actually doing is taking a small problem and turning it into a big problem, which is obviously not helpful. Fantastic. Thanks, Ghost. Um, I don't see any other questions. And, you know, I think for our listeners, this has obviously been a little bit more of a a technical discussion today to what some of you might be used to um, but it also brings to a close our sort of three-part series on thinking about valuing startups and how we think about that um, it's something that we wanted to kind of explore with you and with our with our user base um, so if you've got any other questions please feel free to engage us either you know via email you've got our details via our website I think as we go forward into sort of our next series of webinars, we're going to be moving back towards, you know, talking about themes for founders, for owners, and I guess your more traditional types of businesses. Um, and I'd encourage you, if you've got any particular topics that you'd like us to cover on this webinar, please drop us a mail, let us know, and we'll be very happy to kind of explore, you know, whatever's on your mind. So, Ghost, I'm going to hand over to you for any closing thoughts, and then we can wrap things up. Uh, yeah, nothing really further to add other than it's just been quite interesting to see our startup valuation approach out in the wild and how useful it's been, I think, to founders who are still getting to grips with the economics of whatever they are building. Uh, we always say to our clients, it's less about the final results. Obviously, that is important, but it's more about the process to get there and actually understanding the real drivers of value and the way the unit economics works with scale and what the break even looks like and what the risks are. That is the real value of this thing is it basically ends in having a beautiful strategic financial model with the right level of complexity. It's not about building the last word in Excel. It's about just getting to the core of the business and understanding what you really need to know about it. So yeah, I'll leave it there. And uh, thanks to everyone who attended today. Fantastic. Thanks everyone. I hope you have a fantastic rest of the Thursday and weekend coming up and we look forward to chatting again towards the end or towards the end of June. So have a fantastic day further. Ciao.